Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Ellipse Unsealed podcast. Today, we have with us, again, Ryan Dorheim. <laughs> Ryan, <laughs> nice to see you again. Great to see you guys as well. Um, so, backstory for those of you of you all. Um, we already kind of recorded this podcast, but the audio is just straight garbage, to put it in simple terms. So. Yeah. We're here again having another conversation. And so, yeah, Ryan, we appreciate you doing this for a second time. <laughs> Round two. I love it. <laughs> so, ding, ding. do you want to kind of um, start us off with giving us um, a little background of yourself or telling us who you are? Uh, abs- absolutely. Hi, uh, everyone. I am Ryan Dorheim. I am a technical specialist at Microsoft. Uh, I primarily play in the uh, SMC, small, medium corporate space with Microsoft. Um, and one of the things I align to from an industry perspective is all up government. So a lot of my daily conversations are with cities and counties across the entire U.S. Uh, in regards to technology and that modernization and kind of envisioning what that looks like. Some of my history, though, is uh, prior to Microsoft, um, I have a 15-year career in law enforcement or had a career in law enforcement. Uh, So everything from a sheriff's deputy all the way up to being a sergeant of the motorcycle division and also animal control and uh, what else do we do? Parking for the city of Fargo, North Dakota. Um, I was there for just about 13 years. So uh, grand total is I have a couple years, at least in the public sector, uh, and also working at things on the state level as well from technology, which I think just blossomed into me moving naturally into Microsoft and continuing to be of service to others. So that is really kind of the, the, the backstory there. And I'd love that transition. We talked about it once already, but but just to, to grind it again, just that you know, you know, staying in the public sector, being able to, to leverage that. I've done that throughout my career here and there. Just kind of you know, having bits and pieces that that help push you through to the whatever next opportunity. So, having that experience, um, have you found that it's helpful for you? You know, what's what? How does it help you work better with public sector, you know, uh, communities and organizations through Microsoft? Um, for me, it's like understanding some of the industry challenges, right? So, and and I understand too, like a fire department from Fargo to uh, to a, perhaps somewhere else in the U.S. Um, they're going to have different, you know, policies or procedures, but uh, general underlying the mission is still the same. Same thing mm-hmm. with law enforcement; the mission is still the same. Um, and when you think of all the different public entities that you know that intertwine with one another and even some of the things that are nonprofits in the communities that rely on you know public sector information to help bring services and uh even connections to to citizens um it really kind of just feels like um uh, like home again i, th- I mm-hmm. think that's a great way of of saying it of like hey i had this entire you know uh, servant attitude throughout, you know, a majority of my, you know, working career as a human being, and then transferring into Microsoft, and then, you know, running on technology, and then finding this niche inside of uh, SLG at Microsoft, and recapturing some of those connections that, you know, that really mean a lot that drive me when trying to, you know, help communities do more with with less, right? So yeah. it's such a really cool opportunity of 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 almost like kind of coming home again and understanding at least like, hey, as as some of my former experience in the public sector, um, here's how, you know, we're doing this on the Microsoft platform today. And here's how you know we can start leveraging data to create better um, outcomes, especially as you're doing community-oriented policing, or if you're doing um, just connecting citizens with services, or even from the um, judicial system or something else. Of yeah, of there is so much opportunity there, and so much movement and technology that um, it's really cool to find myself to be part of that um, type of conversation again. And two things that came out of that for me, um, number one, just having somebody as passionate about something like, you know, public, when you, when you go somewhere like the DMV and you talk to somebody and you can tell they're, they enjoy what they're doing, they're passionate about serving the public, they understand the value in what they're doing, that, that goes a long way. 
Um, and, and two, just the amount of, of, of uh, advancement, like you said, that, that Microsoft has made in, um, in public sector, you know, you're seeing a lot of stuff around citizen engagement through the power platform, through commerce. There's just a world of opportunity. Absolutely. No, you, I, I don't think I could have said that any better whatsoever. So cool. Thanks. You said it for me. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> the words out of your mouth. Happy, yeah, happy to oblige. Yeah, all right on. <laughs> Not bad for round two. <laughs> it's like we've got it written down from the script last time. <laughs> right on. <laughs> um, so since you are so passionate about what is what would you say your favorite thing about working in the public sector is personally? Wow. Uh, whew, that's a loaded question. Um, wow. Well, you, you... Think about everything that's happening in in the world today, right? And and there's quite a bit happening on a global scale. Um, so there are a number of challenges like within the public sector, and you know something that I believe is talked about and across throughout the not just here in the U.S. but throughout the globe is you know what needs are you know driving communities and in what issues are faced. So the broader climate today is when you think about like government all up. Um, security and compliance, right? Um, doing more with stagnant or even less budget. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's like there's the expectation of being able to do something on a mobile device here, and be so connected now is so different from when like we were growing up, Bobby. And it's like I'm I'm yeah. not trying to be exclusionary here, but. Um, there's so much that has changed and so many expectations have changed. People want to connect with, you know, their government and, you know, want a, a quick and easy way because this is what we're used to now of, you know, reporting a speeding problem or a pothole in the neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, or even like, hey, you know, what's out there from housing assistance or rental assistance? You know, there are folks that are in need that are kind of continuously looking at ways of connecting of what's available to them. Um, so that way they, you know, communities can continue to grow together and be connected together. Um, so finding ways of connecting that data with the latest and greatest technology that we have, especially with uh, the huge strides that Microsoft has seen and the globe has seen over the course of the last couple of years even, um, how can we use this technology to, you know, turn around and benefit society? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, again, security compliance, do more with less. And then you know, what are we doing to connect that data so that way we're, we're having smarter outcomes? Mm -hmm. You can easily see an opportunity, like you said, was a, you know, just if you start thinking about it, when you, start, you, you release this technology to, to the citizens to understand at how they can ask for things, or even like you know, folks like yourself, you, you mentioned like if I'm you know in my neighborhood I see something that's unsafe a pothole whatever you know I go to the website there's a way for me to send a picture upload create an immediate response you know uh, you know, action that gets into the system as opposed to like you said maybe when I was growing up I would have had to gone down to city hall try to figure out who to talk to file a form you know it, you know the, the the time it would have taken maybe an effort would have probably deterred me from doing anything and be like ah oh, whatever <laughs> you know whereas now it's like <laughs> if it's easy i can take a quick screenshot or whatever and just upload this thing and start a process that potentially creates some action that's that's an awesome advancement mm -hmm. um you know and there, again there's endless possibilities around that you know what what microsoft has to offer and and what you know what it can do for citizen engagement oh uh spot on. Um, and in fact, I, I think of like the first parking ticket I ever got as a high school student and granted it was only like 10 bucks in, in the city of Fargo uh, versus uh, to being now or, or, or back then the sergeant in charge of parking ticket appeals and how much of that was now digitized and we could take care of a lot of those things online. Technology advanced it. It wasn't just a paper copy anymore. There was a digital trail that followed to even like when I left now, um, especially with automatic license plate readers and things like that. All mm -hmm. it takes is a vehicle driving up and down a street. And next thing you know, you have e-citations and an image of your vehicle sitting next to that no parking zone sign and how far things have come since then, right? Yeah. Um, so it's I look at, you know, hey, what are some of those citizen experiences now? The cities that I travel to, um, public parking, typically there's an app now that I would go to, I could pay, you know, to be in this particular parking ramp so I can even avoid 
um, you know, parking in the wrong place now. And that's just an example of parking. And it reminds you, like I've done this, you know, in, in Columbus recently, where I, it was city or uh, city city uh, managed parking, and it reminded me, like 30 minutes before it expired, to say, hey, are you still? Do you still need to park here? Just click this button, and we'll re up you for an hour or whatever. And so I didn't have to walk all the way three blocks down from my meeting and back. And so, yeah, really nice. <laughs> We've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. It is funny, like something as small as parking, like we use it and, you know, half the time you don't even think about the technology that goes behind it or all the thought that had to yep. go into that one simple or what we think, because we're seeing like the end user side of it is simple, but there's a lot of, a lot of work that had to go in behind it. So that's what yep. you to think about. That's something I, I clearly remember when uh, I was first trained in as a police officer, everything was, hey, press hard four copies because you're writing a citation out and there's four carbon copies that go along with it. One goes yeah. to court, one goes here, one goes there, right? Um, and now with uh, e-citations or you know, digital citations, it is literally, you know, scan the license, confirm the information is correct. Mm -hmm. And you know, provide at least a copy of the citation to the to the individual, but everything else now is digitized in the background. Um, yeah, because that would be a big deal if you didn't if it didn't press through and the copy that made it into file was was somehow illegible, and then all of a sudden, if you know, a person who maybe was guilty of an infraction gets off because of a technicality, like oh, was this a, a A or a, or a, or an E or whatever that yeah. you know that it puts it does create a lot you know stronger you know opportunity yep. for for fewer errors and and yeah so and and now we're since we're not using so much paper it's all electronic things you know is that lowering the carbon footprint how are we you know benefiting the planet and as we continue to evolve this and there was a talk i gave at uh, one of the recent summits that we had uh, during public sector day but also uh, i gave a couple other courses during that week and I brought up an image of, of, of a cartoon that depicted of like a family in the future and how everything was automated. They had a robot doing all the cleaning. Uh, they were in autonomous vehicles flying from point A to point B. Uh, there was conveyor belts everywhere. And, and I kind of laughed and I brought up that image of that specific cartoon. And I said, are we there yet? <laughs> and yeah, and and this cartoon was created in 1965, depicting 100 years later, and it's crazy how many things have already come to fruition, and you know how much technology has has been involved in our lives overall, and what that means then when you know people are not only working, working remote. We think of a pandemic. All of a sudden, Microsoft Teams and other types of platforms bubbled up, or we could stay connected as as individuals and continue to work and continue to be productive. Yeah, and and here we are. I think that we're closer than we realize. You know from a cartoon from back in 1965 that was somebody's imagination to you know what is you know really cool touchscreen technology today like you're on the bridge of the of you know some star spaceship you know that was also on tv and you're touching a pane of glass and moving things around and and manipulating and interacting with technology we are closer than ever and especially now with microsoft's movement in ai and generative ai and how we can start making things easier for folks um it really is going to make us be able to focus on things that are going to be more meaningful and productive and put some of the administrative work now to automation and some of the generative ai humans will always you know be in control which is awesome um, so there's a lot of back end things that happen, but also when we look at how a citizen needs to connect, asking a, qu a question, not just querying now, asking a question of how can I find rental assistance in the city of Fargo and being able to ask a bot that's out there that question and have it come back with relative information that's going to be important for me, uh, you know, specifically to where I live is, is huge. Yeah, and it's different than just searching Google. And so you used to search Google or Bing and say, hey, show me rental assistance. And it would give you site after site after site. And then it's still incumbent upon the person to click in and do something. Whereas what you're talking about is, is natural language. Can you tell me how to do this? Yep. And and the results you're going to get is something more hum, human. That's like, oh, yeah, sure. Let me tell you how, you know, here's the steps you would take. And if you if this is the issue, go here and, and just really walks you through the process in a different way. Um, 
which is a, which is a big difference in just searching for information. It, it's next level for sure. And uh, I love the reference. Uh, I just have a theory on on like science scientific like references like you know the cartoon you were talking about that either the person. Like you said, they thought of this cool thing, like, hey, it'd be fun if if you could just turn on the TV and talk to your doctor, and they could, you know, they could diagnose your problem. And then they turn to a scientist and say, hey, scientist person, is this possible? And the scientist goes, hmm, yeah, that's possible. And they're cool, and they do it. Or the scientist goes, wow, I didn't think about that. And then they go and develop it. So it's like yeah. two two things happen: either they they confirm it for the person that it, it's a possibility, or they actually like are inspired. I like to think there's some inspiration there, like somebody hadn't yep. thought of it, but some crazy, you know, cartoon genius thought of it and said, hey, yeah, let me let me just, you know, put this into reality now, because that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and they are great ideas. And, and really, when I think about, uh, like, where Microsoft technology is in, um, there's a saying I came up with is, how code can you go, right? Um, and I did that in a way of I like, you know, 80s, you know, hip yeah. hop and things like yep. that instead of how low can you go. But how code can you go, right? Um, so we have so many creative folks that were creating in code. Mm -hmm. um, and now where technology is is at, in, when we say things like low code, no code, is you don't have to know the code in the background. We now have AI that can, you know, do the code for you. Tell us what you want. So we're bursting this bubble of creativity now of and, and making that creativity uh, to even some non-tech users. And, yeah. and, 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 and again, it now comes down to the difference between, hey, I'm going to query something or write a query versus I'm just going to ask a question to this generative AI and it's going to go search through my data and come back with, you know, these particular results or outcome. And I have, you know, skipped a whole bunch of steps there in between because I didn't have to know code. Um, cause it already exists. It's already been developed in the, in the background. Yeah. So the floor, you know, the, the, the growth we see here is now people can be creative on their level and interact with technology in a way that's going to continue to further, you know, some of those things that you just mentioned, Bobby of like, Hey, some cartoonist came up with this concept and now these concepts are becoming reality yeah. because that gap in technology has now been bridged and we can have natural conversations and and use technology to our advantage to help further things along as an ex developer that's you you bring up a great point like if somebody came to me and said hey can we do this my answer would almost always be yeah we could do much pretty much anything in code it just takes time and effort and you know roi and all these things so you're you're shortening that period of time perhaps and a lot of these these particular potential uh um, opportunities when somebody comes and says, hey, can we do this? They like they don't have to. They can just say say it to the to the machine. Hey, can you do this for me? And and lots of times it's going to be able to do it. So yeah, yep. awesome. Yep, and we see that in the public sector too. And it's uh and I and I think Gartner is is changed the term to business technologist instead of a citizen developer. Mm, right. So in in the public sector, like me as a police officer, right. I wasn't going to go write a program on how to do e-citations or write a program to help an officer, you know, create better crash diagrams for their investigation and things like that. I remember being a crash reconstructionist and using a total station to map out a crime scene so we can put it into technology, bring back a 3D, you know, type of, you know, like two scale things so we can do measurements now in the digital world. So that way we didn't have to do it in the physical world, right? And we capture evidence as it is. Um, but I had to learn a lot about the technology instead of being like straight up police officer. So I became more of that specialist. Mm -hmm. But now with where technology is at, we have business technologists. So me, I was considered probably a citizen developer when I was a police officer because of what I did with technology and what I you know, helped create and things like that. But now we have it across, whether you're in private industry or in the government industry, um, we have analysts, we have so many folks that are crossing into that technology world and creating cool apps inside of power apps or creating automations. And they're using this technology in the background for low and no code to make these creations without hanging so heavily on IT mm -hmm. to be the driver for so many of these. So that business technologist or citizen developer is going to continue to move forward now with a lot more of this low code technology coming into our, our US government platform in, in Microsoft. And it's, it's very exciting to see. Yeah, you bet. 
Yeah, it's amazing how accessible these things are becoming. Um, I know we can, you kind of mentioned earlier um, being at Public Sector Day in the past at Summit. Um, it's kind of just around the corner. Are you planning on being there again this year? I do have an ask in, but it's like with uh, um, Microsoft, like any other business is going to, and there's so many brilliant folks at Microsoft, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I had the the blessing and the opportunity to go to Charlotte and you know be able to present there and connect with so many folks. Um, it may be someone else's turn at Microsoft. Mm. Uh, businesses are still getting you know back into the swing of travel and things like that. Um, we actually have a, an event coming up where partners and Microsofties are coming together in, in Dallas for this type of connection and we're able to you now travel and, and start reconnecting with uh, our peers and with partners as well so we can have sessions such as this, not just podcast style, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but where else can we bring the technology and you know how else can we keep improving and moving forward? Um, so my, the likelihood of me going again is really just in like, hey, is it in the cards? Uh, do other mm -hmm. folks need to go? There's so many cool opportunities where if it's not this one, it could be another one in the future. So I, I hope to travel, uh, but I never really bank on it because we mm -hmm. also get cool blessings such as doing podcasts like this too. You yeah. bet. And uh, the, the summit is also DineCon in Denver, which is which is coming up in May too. Your back and door, if, buddy. Yes, my back door. And if you need <laughs> referrals, you know, both Savannah and I will write a referral to Microsoft right straight to Satya on your behalf because uh, you did a great job at Public Sector Day, really engaging, and we we loved having you there. And it's it, it's been a from from two years ago to last year, it was a huge jump in in attendance. We were at like maybe 50 people, not maybe not even quite 50 people. Right. In 2022. And I think we are close to 80. We had the room packed and really engaged. At once we got them engaged, like that first hour, if you remember, was like, you know, like nobody wants to speak and, you know, the coffee's kicking in. But but as soon as uh, one or two people opened up, it became a pretty uh, good conversation throughout the day on on, like you said, like going back to where we, we started with with, you know, like unique issues that everybody's slightly different but there's always some crossover in what their you know where their concerns are and, and and where they can make advancements with technology yeah if i had an image the uh i i have a deck that i uh that we leverage uh when having certain uh conversations public sector day the day uh and granted there was a lot of finance and operation type of feel from the room that we were in because that's the platform that most folks were using microsoft at the time mm -hmm. but look at naturally how um when we started doing other types of you know presentation of and even just the talk that we ended up having bobby with with the group that was there mm -hmm. it was like we understand that how much public data is out there but how do we make it meaningful to the folks that are you know for the citizens that they serve yeah um, and i think of one of the uh, metro rail systems that happened to be present in the room that day and it was like well could we have generative AI look at and translate, you know, these particular, you know, times of when these, you know, trains are running? I'm like, eh, let's give it a shot. And yeah, we did it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. And yep. in just a short amount of time, uh, we were able to get generative AI to turn around and have, you know, be able to showcase them in five minutes of like, yeah, sure. It, your data already exists here. Let's use generative AI instead of it making it queryable. You can now ask that question. Yeah. And just how blown away they were sitting at that table and then how others started talking and thinking about ways of of using this now low to no code technology to start closing those gaps um, in their city or, or county, or wherever they were at. Um, that movement is, is definitely underway. And it's a really exciting to e even be working for a company right now that is part of that movement. Yeah, you mentioned it before you know, just t how kind of how serious the technology gets. Like, th think back to the beginning of last year when OpenAI kind of hit the market, and yep. and even 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 you know late last year, you you got people like doing funny images or, hey, give me a song in the style of Eminem, you know, but make it about Microsoft, and and it's funny yep. for like you know the first you know couple of weeks, but then all of a sudden you start to see the real application kicking in, and that's the cool part. That's that that's the stage we went to pretty quickly. It like it went yep. from um, you know, funny Dr. Seuss p poems to to kind of serious application, which is which is awesome to see it happen so quickly and so impactfully. Um, and you mentioned security. You mentioned we've talked about power and everything. Anything else in the public sector 
outside that that you know might be coming or you know that's exciting coming from microsoft oh i was on the, a call with the product group just last week and uh obviously i'm chomping at the bit but i can't be ahead of things of you know what would be of microsoft release so i gotta throw the caveat in there you bet but yes there are upcoming focuses being released into public sector slg and not just U.S. specific, right? You and I might talk U.S. specific, things yeah. that are going to be in the government community cloud. So if you heard us say GCC, it stands for government community cloud as we know it here in the U.S. Um, but there are other countries that have already have this technology and are continuously moving forward. So um, I would say, hey, you know, start looking at that worldwide or that global impact uh, mm -hmm. that are happening in other countries or cities, uh, cities that are also leaning on the Microsoft technology to help move this forward. Um, it's all coming to the US, especially with that Azure uh, OpenAI in government. Um, we're going to see in the next few months here uh, more release of, of, of that technology, not only in the M365 space. So if you're using things like Outlook or if you're using things uh, such as Word or PowerPoint, you're going to see something called the Copilot that could be there to help you out uh, create better slides or mm -hmm. you know, create or, and go through. You're having conversations again. Hey, I want to, and, and I just did this personally too with a uh, an agenda I had to build is I'm like, you know, I'm gonna use the Copilot for this. So I went ahead and used a Copilot to help me build an agenda because I'm personally, I'm good at content, I'm good at content creation, but mm -hmm. how do I summarize it down to four or five bullet points that are going to be the top main elements? Yeah. Um, and a co-pilot was able to do it in an instant. And I'm like, this is gold. Wow. Mm -hmm. Something that used to take me so much time and brain yeah. power just to come up with short bullet points. Uh, all of a sudden is done now in just a matter of, of seconds. And, you know, those co-pilots are coming into our business applications and our low-code applications as well. So when we think about creating an automation, we talked earlier about, you know, having to know code. I still believe that we're going to need coders on this planet. We're going to, you know, whether, you know, whatever language you're used to writing in, if it's C-sharp or something else, uh, Microsoft has your back, right? Continue to work in the language that you used to working on, but you can continue now to use this with Azure OpenAI and you can build your own bots, you can build your own things if you are still that you know heavy coder using the Azure aspect, or if you are uh, like an ex-cop like me, um, what is some of that low to no code? How can I innovate and you know close gaps without knowing code? And this is now where we're you know opening up and unleashing those barriers. So be able to see, hey, create an automation, and all I have is this Excel spreadsheet of data, and I know I need to connect it over here. I can now tell Copilot to help me build this automation, and it'll do it using just natural language. That is phenomenal. So we're yeah. seeing some of those things. We'll see more of those things come forward. Uh, so keep an open ear, uh, I can say, on things like uh, Ignite and, 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 and other types of government conversations that Microsoft will have because um, this is going to bridge quite a few things in, in our government communities. Yeah, yeah. Um, you made me think of it, you, the term linguistic coder. I mean, you, you get to a point where it, it, that's a prompter. I mean, so it's not coding, but it is. If you learn to prompt, mm -hmm. I was talking to somebody about they were trying to get some something out of OpenAI, and, and they told me what they prompted. And I was like, well, try this, this, and then this. And did you know you can you know take what you just did and, and throw it back in and reprompt it? And mm -hmm. they didn't. So like learning how to properly feed the system is going to be a job. I mean, that's a, that's a skill that's going to and take some a, learning. At, Absolutely. And there's free training already out there. So yep. on LinkedIn, if you go search in LinkedIn uh, or, you know, on other types of LinkedIn learning or classes on being able to work with generative AI, there is a bit of a learning curve. But once you learn how to, you know, ask the questions to what you want, I mean, turn it into the vision you're seeing into some words that generative yeah. AI can also understand. Um, uh, that was a class class and a certificate worth getting. Uh, it's free. It's actually very short. So please go search LinkedIn Learning, um, and and working with some of these co-pilots in generative AI. It's very worth it. Cool. Yeah. Bobby, you have anything else to ask? No, about? we covered it. We covered it really well the second time. I think you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> I feel I feel like I we, we, went, we we went somewhere else. I think this I, we go around. I, I think it's awesome. Yeah, it, it really worked. I mean, I love the content. It was great. Um, uh, and I, we really appreciate having you here and this insight in public sector. Now, is is there a preferred? I, I use PubSec. I use public sector. SLG. It's all synonymous, right? Or is there one preferred term within Microsoft? Because we call it public sector, but I, we do hear SLG a lot. I, it's, you know, Microsoft is, it, we have lots of acronyms, right? Um, I, I stick, I personally stick to public sector or state and local government, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but overall, you know, if you're doing any research on, you know, Microsoft and government, uh, how I would look it up is, you know, look under anything from worldwide public sector, uh, because that is where you're going to find a lot of these really cool use cases, um, yeah. smart cities, um, having a digital twin of your entire city and being able to develop in that. There are so many aspects of technology and government. Um, I would probably lean towards like, hey, if you're going to be searching at Microsoft, uh, please look at worldwide public sector. Cool. Good tip. Good tip. Yeah, yeah, well, we appreciate having you on for the second time, and yeah, we'll do it absolutely. again. Yeah, for a third time at some point. Maybe not next week, but, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll give you a couple week break, and then we'll we'll ring you up again. Yeah. Oh, please do, please do. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, cool. Thanks again, Ryan. It's always great to chat with you. So well, thank you, Savannah. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bobby. Yep. Yeah. All righty. Well, we'll talk Take care. to you later. Bye. All right. Be good. I love it. And we should have done this Friday. We should have done it Friday because it is, it was like Groundhog Day. It was like, we're back doing the podcast again with Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I feel like, I feel like we're bringing Friday up would be perfect. Murray movie. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Phil? <laughs> Phil Ryerson? All right.